Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone's doing well. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. Um, we got tons of ground to cover this morning, so let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will uh, we will continue on. Lord, thank you so much for the clarity of your word. Thank you how it aligns with history, how we're able to track um, ideas and concepts and thoughts um, and uh, just see uh, just how uh, belief systems and ideologies and philosophies have developed over time um, uh, to lead us to some of the conclusions we make. Thank you, God, that even though these things may be erroneous at times, that your word still remains true. And that um, for those of us who seek to use the method that you prescribe for us in scripture, uh, we're able to see things uh, plainly and clearly. I pray, God, that this would be beneficial and productive and that overall, Lord, you would be glorified in this. We thank you so much. For it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay. Uh, today, um, we're actually going to be taking a historical detour. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about history. Some of the stuff we've already covered in previous lectures and conferences and things like that. However, it is relevant for this lecture that we're doing today. Okay. Uh, let's start off by uh, continuing to talk about and discuss uh, where we are concerning um, the dream here uh, of Nebuchadnezzar. We are in Daniel chapter 2 and going through the explanation of Daniel's um, um, uh, explanation of some of the of these things that uh, he, uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw. Uh, the head of gold in Daniel chapter 2 um, is representative of Nebuchadnezzar's rule of not just over the city of Babylon, but over the region as well. Okay? And he is the one that starts off this particular dream that God has given to him. Um, the chest and the arms of silver we've looked at and we've come to conclude based upon some of the details and the historical uh, information that this is Cyrus the Great. Okay. And then, of course, the belly and the thighs of bronze. Or, I'm sorry, Cyrus the Great. And then the belly and thighs of bronze is Alexander the Great's rule over the region and city of Babylon. Of course, we've been looking at this. Um, this is our diagram here of uh, this image that Daniel has seen. And now we are focused on the legs um, of this particular statue. And we've been spending a lot of time uh, looking at the details and some of the uh, historical history surrounding this particular time in history as Daniel has given this information to him. Um, remember that there is a question that um, I want us to continue to ask ourselves. It is, um, uh, will and I's uh, goal, our motivation, um, to always have this at the forefront of our minds when we're studying, even throughout the week, when we're kind of talking with one another, asking each other questions about what we're studying, um, and the topics that we're covering here uh, to bring to you guys um, are the conclusions that we uh, are coming to. And it, it doesn't, it's not just us, but anytime you read uh, a commentary, either, either anytime that you read an article um, online, um, where you, when you hear a podcast or um, a, you know, a YouTube channel with another teacher, are the conclusions that a person is coming to about the explanation of a text, any text, any scripture, um, in my case, more specifically this one, am I being, uh, am I looking at the normal usage of the language? Am I considering the grammar? Am I considering the history and the culture? And am I doing this consistently? When it comes to not just uh, the, the, the statue itself, but particularly this part, the legs of iron, we have, to con we have to continue to have this in the forefront of our minds. Okay? 
This concerns the issue of the fourth kingdom. Now, I mentioned that most of the commentators, that, and I'm continuing to look, by the way. Um, it's not that I haven't stopped looking. Um, um, but from the time that I constructed this teaching, the commentators that I looked at, and it was well over about 20 of them, close to 30, believe that Daniel is discussing the rise and the endurance of the Roman Empire. This has been the prevailing teaching for a long time okay, within our, uh, within greater evangelicalism, I would even say Christianity in general. And I sought to offer a different explanation, an alternative explanation on what I am convinced that Daniel is saying to Nebuchadnezzar. Again, I would like to submit to you again that the fourth kingdom, for those of you guys who may not have known or may have missed it, even those who you guys are online, that Nebuchadnezzar is not talking about the Roman Empire or the kingdom, the Roman Empire or the kingdom as it's described, but it is the Parthian Empire or the Parthian kingdom that he is discussing. So going back to our review from last week, we took a kind of a, a deep dive into the Parthian Empire, the players, the influence they had, the, the, inf uh, the power they wielded, and we saw a couple of things. One, we discussed the history, military, economics, and the religion of this particular empire. And we discovered that this empire was influential throughout the ancient world. I put that map up and there were even some cities and district states of, Par of, Parth of Parthia that were in the Roman Empire, okay? The Roman Empire uh, didn't have any district cities in their empire, but they certainly had some in theirs, right? They controlled commerce and trade they had a, a large portion of the Royal Road, and they even shared a lot of the Silk Road from the East. They were heavily involved in politics. As a matter of fact, Ectabania, that city was highly political. And if you controlled that particular city, you controlled the political decisions that were involved, particularly within that region. They had control of that. They had control of the Caspian Sea, and it could be argued the Black Sea. They had control of the Euphrates River when they took over uh, Seleucia and Babylon. They were known throughout that. They were on, they were known throughout the known world at that time. They had a skilled tactical military. That was unrivaled for a long time. We talked about the Parthian shot, that they were able to shoot backwards on horseback at full speed, which made them formidable. They had a, a, a military guard known as cataphracts. We talked about them with the long spears that would jab the front lines. Um, it, again, it is said that Rome, Rome uh, tried uh, to conquer them several times and were unsuccessful in their attempts. They could not, they could not gain any ground. An interesting note is they had influence over the city and region of Babylon well into 100 AD. I mean, well into 100 AD and, and the Parthian Empire, again, was the centerpiece of trade and commerce. As a matter of fact, I mentioned this um, just so you know, in Revelation chapter 17, all the way back then, I'm sure you remember it, um, I discussed the Parthian Empire back then. It was very brief, okay? We talked about a king by the name of Pacorus II. Pacorus II, I'm convinced, was the, uh, the, the one that the messenger was telling John who the ruler was over Babylon. Now, what's interesting about Revelation chapter 17 is that it has everything to do with the city, the city of Babylon and the rulers 
that govern that city. So chapter two of Daniel focuses on the region itself. Revelation 17 focuses on the city itself. And those who governed and overruled or, or ruled over those cities. So if you want to get a brief kind of synopsis of, uh, of Parthia and kind of their influence. Matter of fact, this is kind of what got me on this trajectory to kind of scratch my head and go, why is Parthia mentioned and not Rome? That's that, 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 that's 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 confusing to me. So last week at the end of the lecture that we talked about, I asked another new question. If it's not Rome and if it is the Parthian Empire, right? And I bring up Mr. Mr. Mrs. Eustace's question, what is the point of all this, right? Well, this is huge because again, this has everything to do with the explanation of the text. I believe we have to get this right because this impacts the rest of the book. So if we get, if we, if it's truly Rome, then we should be able to see this expressed clearly throughout the book. And if it is Parthia, we should see how it plays out throughout the rest of the book. But if you recall last week, <clears throat> since it is uh, 1900 years of history that individuals have said Rome, it's always been Rome. Why do people, when they study this text, read the passage and believe that the fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire? Why, why does this still continue? Why is there no alternative? At least in the major uh, you know, writings and uh, texts and commentaries and, um, and papers and things like that. Why is it all, it's the Roman Empire and, and no other alternative? I seek to offer an explanation for this. Okay. Why this is. But first, before we uh, get to my explanation of why this is, we have to take a detour and talk about something. I'm going to bring up what is known as the obvious fallacy. A fallacy, uh, if you don't know, is a uh, it's an error in in thinking and logic and reasoning. Okay? Um, what is the obvious fallacy? Let's go ahead and take a look at this description. The obvious fallacy is when a person or a group of individuals in order to persuade a person to be convinced that what they're saying is true or accurate will use such words as obviously it's this or undoubtedly it's this or certainly it's this right or reasonable people hold that dot 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 so they will use these particular phrases to, to underscore that what they're saying is true. These statements, like many others like them, are presented to others and are used in exchange for logical reasons. They won't explain how they got there. They will just use these words to kind of summarize, right? It, it's obvious that I'm a handsome man. <laughs> Right. That's kind of how this works. So let's go through uh, the trajectory of time and look at some of the commentaries that I looked at. In regard to this particular passage in Daniel, we will start off with Josephus, Josephus, the uh, historian who wrote Antiquities. He comments on this particular uh, uh, section when he says this, this is the dream which thou sawest and its interpretation is as follows. The head of gold denotes thee, the kings of Babylon that have been before thee, but the two hands and arms signify this, that your government shall be resolved by two kings. But another king that shall come from the West armed with brass, so destroy that government from the West. And another government that shall be like unto iron shall put an end to the power of the former. 
and shall have dominion over all the earth on account of the nature of iron, which is stronger than that of gold, silver, and of brass. Daniel also did declare the meaning of the stone to the king, but I do not think proper to relate it, since I have only undertaken th to describe things past or things present, but not things that are future. Even back then, Josephus accounts that there would be another king from the explanation of Daniel that shall come from the West. How does he know that? Who knows, right? He doesn't, just, he doesn't tell us why he knows that they come from the West. He just tells us that this king is coming from the West, right? Of course, undoubtedly. How about Irenaeus? Irenaeus, another, now he's not a historian. He is a, a theologian and a philosopher of sorts. He writes this. In a still clearer light has John in the apocalypse indicated to the Lord's disciples what shall happen in the last times and concerning 10 kings who shall arise among whom the empire which now rules, now rules, the earth shall be partitioned. He teaches us that when the 10 horns shall be which were seen by Daniel, telling us that thus it had been said to him and the 10 horns which which thou sawest are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but shall receive power as of kings for one hour with the beast. These have one mind and gave their strength and power to the beast. That's Revelation chapter 17. Irenaeus connects Daniel 2 to Revelation 17 and then discusses that there's an empire which now rules. This empire, according to Irenaeus, is found in Revelation 17 and Daniel 2, in the same era he's living in. Which, you know, if you're looking, you know, in the time period that Irenaeus lived in, that was, you know, Rome. Irenaeus continues, and he says this, These have one mind and give their strength and power to the beast. They shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. Because he is the Lord of hosts and the King of kings, it is manifest, therefore, that these potentates, he who, shall, he who is to come shall slay thee and subject the remainder of his power to his power, and that he shall himself be eighth among them. And they shall lay Babylon to waste and burn her with fire and shall give their kingdom to the beast and put the church to flight. Now, if you remember in Revelation 17, Church ain't there. We talked about that tons of times, right? But for Irenaeus, in his perspective and where he's looking at, he seems to think that the time that he's living in, present, that the time that he's living in underscores Revelation 17 and Daniel 2. After that, they shall be destroyed by the coming of our Lord, for that the kingdom must be divided and thus come to ruin. You want to know why they expand the legs to the feet, right? That the, that the feet are just an expansion of Rome. This comes from Irenaeus. How about Hippolytus? Despite the fact that he sounds uh, uh, like a BD, that you need to go to, uh, to the clinic to get treated. He says this about Daniel 2. He says, the golden head of the image and the lioness denoted the Babylonians. The shoulders and arms of silver uh, represented the Persians and the Medes. The belly and thighs of brass and the leopard meant the Greeks. He's, he's connecting Daniel 2 to Daniel 6. We will talk about Daniel 6 when we get there. Who held sovereignty from Alexander's time. So he recognizes uh, the Perds, the Medes, and the Greeks. The legs of iron and the dreadful bee and the beast, dreadful and terrible, express the Romans who hold sovereignty at present. 
So Politus, along with Irenaeus, is convinced that Daniel 2 and Daniel 6, respectively, are about Rome. And again, the time that he's living in. Okay? Aphorates, in his writing, mentions something very fascinating. He says this, and the legs and the feet of the statue were of iron, which is the kingdom of the children of Shem, who are the children of Esau. What? Which is strong as iron. This is interesting. Aphorates has an interesting explanation for this. He believed or were convinced that the Edomites were the first to accept what was known as the Apostles' Creed, right? As a result of that, they bought uh, a, the, a cult to Rome, which later became the state religion. That's kind of his idea here, that, that he's looking at the trajectory of time and seeing that those who adopted the Nazarene Creed or the Apostles' Creed took this creed to Rome and, you know, over a period of time, right, and lots of persecutions and things like that, that Christianity essentially became the state religion, thus uh, uh, sealing uh, essentially uh, Rome's prominence throughout, uh, throughout the centuries. Let's look at Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril of Jerusalem. He said this about the fourth kingdom. He said, now these things we teach not of our own invention, but having learned them out of the divine scriptures used in the church and chiefly from the prophecy of Daniel just now read, as Gabriel also the archangel interpreted it. What? Do, do we remember do we remember Gabriel being in chapter two? Okay. Speaking thus, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon earth, which will surpass all kingdoms. And that this kingdom is that of the Romans has been the tradition of the church interpreters. As for the fourth king, as for the first kingdom, which now became renowned, was that of the Assyrians, and the second of that and the Medes and Persians together, and after these, that of the Macedonians was the third. So the fourth kingdom now is that of the Romans. Do you see a pattern here? All of them are expressing Rome, but none of us, none of them are telling us how they got there. They're just telling us what it is, not how they got there. As a matter of fact, Cyril of Jerusalem at least is kind of honest because he goes, oh, well, yeah, it's Rome. Well, because the church has always interpreted it this way. Jerome. Jerome writes in his commentary on Daniel. We'll talk about the times that they lived in, by the way. I'm kind of just, we'll talk about the eras in which they lived in. Um, Jerome writes this, now the fourth empire, which clearly refers to the Romans. What, what does that tell you? That sounds, like, that sounds like a fallacy to me. Clearly? Now the fourth empire, which clearly refers to the Romans, is the iron empire, which breaks in pieces and overcomes all others. But its feet and toes are partly of iron and partly of earthenware, a fact most clearly demonstrated at the present time, for just as there was at first, nothing stronger or hardier than the Roman realm. So also in these last days, there's nothing more feeble. So Jerome does something almost, he, he does something kind of shrewd here. Okay? So he, he mentions that Rome is the legs of iron. And then he says at the end, so in these last days, there's nothing more feeble. He extends Rome essentially to the explanation of the feet of iron and clay without putting it there. Very shrewd. So we looked at all of these individual theologians, which clearly, clearly, they uh, explain that this particular text here is, 
talking about Rome and its influence. How about the RCC? The RCC takes a different take. In a website, uh, they uh, interpret that these four are the Babylonian kingdom, gold, that of the Medes and the Persians, silver, the Greek and the bronze, or the Greek bronze and that of iron as the Egyptian kingdom. What? By the way, Ptolemy, the Ptolemonic kingdom is mentioned in Daniel. We'll talk about that when we get there. But in chapter two, I don't think so. However, there's another website, or better yet, another commentary that says this. The fourth kingdom, some understand this of the successors of Alexander, the kings of Syria and Egypt, others of the Roman Empire and its civil wars. The former supposition seems best, though. The latter is almost universally received, and it will be explained hereafter. The Roman Empire did not immediately rise out of Alexander's and had no relation to the Jews, but it surely swallowed up all that he had left to his generals and proved the greatest scourge to the Jewish nation, which has been ever since scattered, while the kingdom of Christ gains ground and will flourish till that of Rome shall be no more. Um, Leo Haydock is uh, a theologian of the RCC. So which one is it? Is it the Egyptian kingdom or is it Rome? Just put obviously in front of it and whatever, and whatever you say afterwards is right. Martin Luther, let's talk about him. Martin Luther wrote a commentary on the book of Daniel. I don't know if you know that. And he uh, underscores this. For Daniel prophesies boldly and determines plainly that the coming of Christ and the beginning of his kingdom, that is his baptism and preaching, is to happen 510 years after King Cyrus. And the empire of the Persians and Greeks is to be at an end. And the Roman Empire enforced that Christ, therefore, must certainly come at a time of the Roman Empire. And when it is best, and when it is in its best state, and that it was to destroy Jerusalem and the temple, since after it no other empire was to come, but the end of the world was to follow, as Daniel clearly announces in Daniel 2 and 7. So Martin Luther, he underscores the Roman Empire. He actually gives an explanation of why he thinks this is, because Christ was born under Roman rule, right? And since Christ was born under Roman rule, he was there to establish said kingdom. So it would be quite logical to assume that the fourth kingdom is about Rome because Christ was born under Roman authority, okay? Again, I think that he's incorrect here. Um, if I may be so bold to say, but at least he provides an explanation for why he believes this is, right? Just rather than saying, well, it's clearly the Roman Empire. How about Jean? Good old Jean Calvin. Jean Calvin. We're almost done here. He writes this. Here the fourth empire is described which agrees only with the Roman. Oh, for we know that the four successors of Alexander at length were subdued. Philip was the first king of Macedon and Antichus the second. Yet Philip lost nothing from his own kingdom, yet he, re yet he yielded it to the free cities of Greece. It was therefore hitherto entire, except as it paid tribute to the Romans for some years on an account of the expenses of the war. You notice that Everybody's mentioning all of these generals and their region except for one. We're Seleucius. I mean, it's like we totally just missed Parthia. No one's even mentioned it. How about this individual? We talked about him before. Again, this is a gentleman from our camp. Um, again, I, I, I have a great respect for this man. Again, he wrote a commentary on uh, the entire scriptures, by the way. You can get it online pretty much for free. 
He says this. He says, Rome defeated the last vestige of the Greek Empire in Rome in 31 BC and ruled for hundreds of years until 476 AD in the Western Roman Empire and until AD 4, 1453, really, in the Eastern Roman Empire. The Eastern and Western divisions of this empire crushed all opposition with brutal strength that surpassed many of its predecessors. Certainly, certainly, iron legs fitly symbolize the Roman Empire. Rome also dominated the map more extensively than any other previous kingdom, well, with the exception of Parthia. Encompassing almost all of Europe, including Spain, the British Isles, as well as India, those legs stood astride most of the ancient world. Again, as you can see, there's a lot of individuals who say a lot of things about the Roman Empire. However, I think that one's philosophical position and their worldview impacts how they interpret or explain this particular phenomenon. For example, um, Martin Luther mentioned the destruction of the temple by Titus Flavius in 70 AD. Well, what does that have to do with Babylon? We'll get there in a second. Okay. 70 AD was an important time because, uh, again, the Romans came in and raised, uh, ran most of the uh, Jews out of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, desecrated it, and then destroyed it, took the rest of the effects out of it. We had in 135 AD the removal of Jews out of Israel by the Romans, right? This is the Bar Kokhba revolt, okay? In the same year, we have the changing of the name of Jerusalem's uh, name in Israel. It was no longer called Israel, but Arialina Capitolina. Later on, it was renamed to Syria, Palestina. Okay. Because of this, uh, as I mentioned before in previous lectures, because of all of these things that caused all of these individuals who wrote throughout this time to look at these places now as symbolic, one of them was Israel. Since you have no Israel, and most of the, and most of the uh, Jews are scattered throughout the known world, well, what do you do with text like Zion? What do you do with text like peace to the Israel of God? What do you do with those? Well, you just symbolize them. Since there is no literal Israel, then this must be talking about us then, right? We're spiritual Israel. Zion is not Jer Jerusalem because that's been conquered. So Zion must be the church. So you have the allegorization and symbolization of geographical locations. You have the emperor-led persecutions of believers by the Roman Empire, right? fierce persecution all over the place, it could be reasonable to assume that, man, we're going through it. This must be the days of the end. <clears throat> and of course, you have the theological tradition of the prominent religious traditions, that when RCC became the, the religion of the West, it didn't adjust its perspectives. It just continued to teach them, as it always had been. That includes Israel being a spiritual Israel or being synonymous with the church. And that also included Babylon being symbolically explained away as well. Joseph Flavius, Josephus Flavius lived from 37 AD to 100 AD, so he saw all of this go down, particularly the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Irenaeus lived from 130 to 202 AD. He saw the, uh, essentially heard about the rise of Bar Kokhba and what happened then. He lived during the time 
when the when the name changed from Jerusalem to Arialina Capitolina and later on Syria Palestina. Hippolytus was influenced by this. He lived in 170 to 235 AD, just, a, just about and around the time, again, of all of this information and the change in explanation of these texts, not seen as a literal, literal Israel or a literal Jerusalem or a literal people. This also impacted the way that he saw Babylon that Babylon was not actually Babylon, but Babylon was the Roman Empire. Aphorates, again, uh, lived between the time of persecution as well as Christianity becoming the religion of the West through RCC, the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, you had many other theologians, again, that were explaining uh, that the fourth, uh, the legs of iron were, uh, were Rome at this point. Jerome lived from 347 to 420 AD. Again, that's the, again, that's the rise of, again, uh, Christianity becoming the state religion um, or the religion of the West. Then you had the establishment of uh, the Roman Catholic Church. I know that most, I know that the Roman Catholic Church says that they were instituted uh, in Matthew with Peter and Jesus. No, no, no. It's three eighty. It's three eighty A.D. Okay, let's let's just, let's be clear about that. Okay. Three eighty A.D. to present day. Martin Luther during the time of the Reformation, fourteen eighty three to fifteen forty six. He was influenced by the Roman Catholic Church, uh, did not change or alter his doctrines at all concerning this stuff, concerning the eschaton, concerning Daniel, Daniel 2, Daniel 6, even Revelation 17. And of course, John Calvin was also influenced in a very similar way to Martin Luther. This is why you have 1900 years, I believe, of this particular explanation and no alternative. And all of the examples and many others give us the give us the that Daniel 2 is this, but they don't tell us how they got there. Those who may interpret this as Rome may do this because they observe Christ being born in the Roman Empire. I would call this a Christocentric view of the text. That they're looking for Christ in this text. I find it to be very fascinating that in the explanation of Daniel chapter 2, it just mentions the kingdoms, but not the kings. The kingdoms that uh, that are it doesn't the, the word king isn't even mentioned in the text. It's just the kingdoms that govern over Babylon. Now there are representatives of these kingdoms, of course, like Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, and so on and so forth. But the word kings in Aramaic isn't used. It's it's kingdoms. Christ, in his first advent, was offering the kingdom of God in a spiritual sense within the fourth kingdom. That is Rome. These individuals, I believe, were convinced of this because of the way that they wrote. They didn't see Israel, nor did they see Babylon as being literal Babylon. This explanation may be convinced that the Roman Empire may continue, but it takes a different form. This is why we have all these other forms. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church is Babylon. No, America is Babylon. American evangelicalism is Babylon. The World Health Organization is Babylon. Well, there could be an argument made for that. But, um, but anyway, the point is, 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 is 
all of these explanations, you know, you spiritualize in everything, you could put anything in there. And of course, this may cause one to allegorize certain texts when cross-referencing Revelation chapter 17, Daniel 6, Daniel 7, Daniel 2. Again, recall that Babylon is a region located in Mesopotamia. Even when the city was gone, even when it was destroyed, the region was still known as Babylon. That didn't change. Again, Babylon was a stronghold for defense and commerce. If you control this, you controlled, you basic, he who controls the spice or Arrakis controls the spice. It's the same thing. He who controls Babylon controls, controls the region, the Fertile Crescent. Now, that's not to say that Rome was not a significant kingdom. It was. It's mentioned in the text in the Greek scriptures. It plays a role in biblical history. I mean, Jesus met with Pontius Pilate. Paul even mentions this. However, there is no record when it comes to Rome or it comes to Babylon that Rome ever governed Babylon, right? As a matter of fact, Babylon was conquered by a man named Trajan in 116 AD. He died a year after he conquered it. And then after that, uh, Hadrian, a Roman emperor, basically resigned control over the land of the east of the Euphrates River. He gave it back to them. He just left it. So they only had it for a year, and then they were done. It wasn't until after this, uh, 117 AD, that Babylon became a territory of vassal states that retained their language of Aramaic. They never lost it. At this point in history, the people and the citizens of Babylon do not have a king reigning over them. After 117 AD, it was, it was done. In fact, the region in the city basically switched alliances between the Romans and the Persians. So they just kept going back and forth with the land. Rome attempted to recapture the city in Babylon in 226 AD. They tried to do it several times even before then, but they never, ever recaptured the city. They, they had it for one year. One year. So if we are employing the literal grammatical historical method, the word Babylon from the perspective of the readers and of the writers, much like the word Israel, when and where this occurs and what it's talking about within the general context is always meant to be understood as a geographical region, nothing else. Okay? And if you keep that the center of it all, well, then it makes sense that it is the Parthian Empire and not the Roman Empire. The dream is given to King Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of the region of Babylon and the city of Babylon. Makes sense. The other two kingdoms that are described in this text have to do with the city and region of Babylon. Persian Empire, 539 BC, they took Babylon. Greece, Alexander the Great. Matter of fact, Alexander the Great was buried in Babylon. He was buried there. He wanted to make it its capital. If Babylon is the center of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense that it's Rome. It can't, it, can't be, it can't even be an option. So it could be possible to sum up that the explanation of this passage of scripture has been influenced by a person's theological, and I would even say historical perspective of the time that they're living in. They, 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 they historicized the text. It's like they took the scriptures in a newspaper. They were doing the same thing, taking scriptures in a parchment paper, 
the day the daily Rome and just said this this seems to fit. I'm convinced based upon the language of the text that this this is discussing the influence of the kingdoms. However, I believe it is in relation to Gentile history, specifically Babylonian history. We often miss that. And of course, if the land of Babylon is considered, this keeps in line with the normal way that Babylon is understood with the view of the writer, not the reader. Okay, we had to stop and take a detour. We will uh, continue to uh, go through Daniel chapter two and look at these feet. If, if, if the feet in, of iron and clay are not an extension of Rome, well, then what is it, right? We will, talk, we will begin to unpack that next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, just for this time. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word and the clarity of it and that it aligns with history. I pray, God, that we would continue to wrestle through this, ask questions, observe the text plainly, and, uh, and continue, Lord, to build upon uh, these concepts and ideas uh, from a literal, grammatical, historical, and cultural method. Thank you so much for who you are and for what you do. What's in your son's name?